these two guys have Minnesota sports flowing in their veins. Mackie and Judd on Score North and scorenorth.com. Reckless speculation. Reckless speculation. Yeah. Happy Reckless Speculation Thursday here. Mackie and Judd. We got our friend from the Five Eyewitness News Sports Department, Darren Doogie Wolfson, in the house. Uh, fresh off two weeks of free agency, inside information, and scoopage. Doogie, welcome in. Judd, Declan. Good morning, Philip. Welcome back from Los Angeles, hanging with Lord Kilby. I mean, I can only imagine, Phil. You're like, why the heck am I back here in the Twin Cities? I could have just stayed here in L.A., Southern California. It's actually pouring rain. It's pouring rain for three oh, days, yeah. like 50 I'm sure degrees. It was really hard. Rain. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> it is tough when you <laughs> go out there and, and all of the celebrities and luminaries want to yeah. hang out with old Macadac now that Purple God. Daily is a top 10 national football podcast, that, according to Apple. That is one <laughs> overrated city, though. Los Angeles. Whoa. I love, whoa. San, I love San Fran. Seattle, Phil, love it, fantastic. Uh Oh, Oh, no. Los Angeles, California, completely Uh overrated, and I was born in Hollywood. Uh Oh, Oh, no. Uh Uh-oh. I'm from there. Hot take, Cobbs. With the men and women of sports talk. (laughs) I I, I mean, I guess it's overrated in terms of, like, you know, for being, like, the city to gravitate toward. I don't know that I ever want to live there, but it's a good – you go there for a few days, you can have a good time in Los Angeles. New York. I'm going to New York every time. Never do a convention in Los Angeles that can be done in the Big Apple, Manhattan. It's, way, it's been, it, it was in Big. It way, was in. It was in New York better. last year. Well, tell Barrett to get his act together. New York every year or <laughs> Chicago. Are you literally just lashing out against Hollywood right now? This is I don't like. Oh, I don't like it. I do, I seriously don't like it. <laughs> I'll give you the best convention city. I would never live there, but it's New Orleans. You go to yeah. New Orleans. Yeah, There's a, a casino point. downtown. You navigate. You know, the French Quarter at night, like you can't beat New Orleans for a convention. Na- navigating Garrett, might not be the word yeah. I would use well, yeah. for the Gar- French Quarter, but yeah. Darren, you don't. In- indulging. You survive it. Oh, yes. Survive. You survive the French Quarter. <laughs> Navigate sounds like you're in control. It's in control of you. One hurricane and it's all over. Amazing. I was there January of 02, or maybe it was early February, for that Patriots Rams Super Bowl, the U2 halftime show, all that. And Ooh. hook, line, and sinker. I'm 22 years old. Oh, God. I got taken by one of those street guys, you know, the cop and the dice and all that. And he got me for like 40 bucks. So it wasn't like, oh, no. Like, that's the worst story I have from the French Quarter. But he got me really good. Mm. Um, well, uh, better than the time I got taken for some fake Oakleys in New York. And maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe the fact that they were being pulled from a trash bag was probably my first hint. But, uh, Oh, you bought Anyways, it on the street? Oh, come on. I was like 17. I was just... Okay. Yeah, the fake Rolexes idiot. and yeah. all that. Yeah, we've yeah. all been there. Yeah. So well, anyways, uh, well, let's go into the... Speaking of into the into the trash bag, let's go into the scoop bag here and uh, talk some Vikings. So let's start with something highly speculative here, Doogie, because the other day, bookies.com, it might have been yesterday or, or like two nights ago, bookies.com came out with Lamar Jackson odds. And uh, the Ravens were number one, 30% chance for Lamar just to go back to Baltimore. But the fourth team on that list with 15% odds was the Vikings. You got Jeremy Fowler floating out the report from last weekend. You know, there's just, there's some weird steam, I guess. And it just feels awfully quiet on the Vikings front. So what what do you make of it? What do you make of some, some Lamar Jackson Vikings steam here? Well, I mean, it is Reckless Speculation Thursday. So, I mean, it's a perfect talker. I don't see any resolution anytime in the near future. I want to see what shakes out draft weekend. Can we circle back to this in early May? What do the Vikings do draft weekend? Now, I get it. I mean, Baltimore, to me, should be you know more than or however you look at the odds. I mean, to me, they should be like minus 600, not minus 300, right? Because they can match any offer correct So, how exactly phil are the vikings making an offer where the ravens say you know what we'll take your two first round picks minnesota we are not matching that yeah that's where i'm stuck now do i think that he could work here potentially yeah i mean i think you know somebody like the kentucky quarterback makes a bit more sense in the short term for kevin o'connell but do i think lamar 
could work? Yeah, I absolutely do. But I also think about long-term extensions for Justin Jefferson, for Christian Derrissaw to a lesser extent. TJ Hawkinson, they do want to extend Hawkinson, just less money. But, like, how would you make all that work cap-wise? And I get it, the cap is going up, up, up. But, like, I just I want to see what happens draft weekend because I just don't think Lamar is going to find – any sort of deal that there's any sort of resolution in the next few weeks. Yeah. I don't think anybody's going to give up a 2023 first round pick right now. So I think an offer sheet, which is coming from somebody or somebody's uh, will happen after the draft. I think the headline from the Vikings perspective on this entire conversation is this though. And it's not surprising. I think they're doing their due diligence on every single possibility and mm-hmm. they should be. Kirk's going into his last year. I mean, Kirk could come back, but they don't know that right now. And because, Dukes, I'm with you. It's like it's hard to get your head around exactly what they're after here. Like, could you pay Jackson and still pay Jefferson, blah, blah, blah. But I don't think that's the headline. I think it is uh, that it's, it's, you know, leaked out to various sources, rightfully so, that they are investigating Lamar Jackson, Levis, Hendon Hooker. Like, I think they're looking into every single thing basically turning over every single rock in saying, if Kirk Cousins does not come back, we're not going to pigeonhole ourselves into this has to be it. So I actually applaud this. I think all of the reckless speculation to a large degree, you guys, is true. But I don't think that means it leads to one particular thing. I agree. I mean, heck, one year ago, there was some exploring on Deshaun Watson, right? What if Lamar, is it possible in the end... He takes the $32 million, plays on that non-exclusive franchise tag, then he's free or maybe there's a better opportunity for him to switch teams one year from now. So the Vikings would be doing their due diligence now but can continue it throughout the year. Heck, talking about due diligence, I mean, Jim Nagy, who runs the Senior Bowl, he would know he's got Kevin O'Connell today in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, for Alabama's pro day, hmm. right? Bryce Young. Now, do I see any scenario where Bryce Young ends up here? Now, Alabama's got about 40 legit NFL prospects, yeah. right? But why is Kevin O'Connell, deep down an offensive guy, what is he doing at Alabama's pro day? Oh, by the way, tomorrow in Lexington, Kentucky, is Kentucky's pro day. Most of the NFL personnel that will be in Tuscaloosa today will be in Lexington, Kentucky Tomorrow, we noted a few weeks ago, now it's picked up steam all over the place, about Kevin O'Connell having legit interest in the Kentucky quarterback, Levis. Right now, is there any scenario where the Vikings could move up high enough? Or would he fall? I have a hard time believing he falls to the teens, but could the Vikings get up as high as six or seven? I think that's something that we need to continue to explore as we get closer to draft weekend. Yeah, and, you know, we, we've made now for, I want to say, two years that Chiefs comparison, right? And and it's not a foregone conclusion that if you trade up 15 picks, you're going to find a Patrick Mahomes. No one's saying that, but it's just about if you're constantly competitive and either in the playoffs or close, and the Vikings expect to be again, even with this sort of roster transition and reset, they, they're, they're not tanking. They expect to go out and win 10, 11, 12 games or nine games or whatever it is. And I would assume they're going to expect the same thing in 2024. Then you really have two choices. You can either maybe, well, three choices. You could uh, just kind of wait till like the third, fourth round and grab a Kellen Mond and cross your fingers and pray. You could reach in the first round for a Christian Ponder like they did 10 years ago. Or, you know, we saw Daniel Jeremiah. Was it Daniel Jeremiah that had Hendon Hooker? Going to the Vikings at 23. Hooker doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, right? Our buddy Tyler, who does this stuff on a daily basis, breaks down the film, notes that Hooker is, what, 25 years old? And rehabbing from I mean, what's Lamar? I mean, you talk about chasing Lamar Jackson. (laughs) Yeah. Hendon Hooker, Lamar Jackson, what, about a year apart, right? And you look at that Tennessee offense, just not a whole lot of creativity by design, right? I mean, Tennessee had a great year, but... The quarterback isn't asked to do a lot. Schemed up very much. Yeah, so. that seems like but that, that would be but a I'm, reach. And I agree, but it, but it doesn't. But it doesn't disqualify you from being able to like pick up an NFL system at some point. So I think I think Agreed. people are running and, a little hey, too far with that narrative. Jeremiah has so many contacts, right? That wasn't thrown out loosely, right? 
he was given some intel as he mocked Hooker at 23, just like Jeremy Fowler. We know Jeremy going back to his Vikings beat days for the Pioneer Press going back many, many years. We all know that he's got plenty of NFL contacts, NFL sources. He did not just randomly throw out the Vikings in that Lamar Jackson equation. In fact, I would guess that he actually knows more th- than he wrote about it. I would agree. Yes. And like just floated it, but he knows more than than that. O- on the Jeremiah uh, mock draft, which I don't think is necessarily close to being accurate, but I find it to be very interesting. If I'm not mistaken, he had Levis falling into the teens, right? Washington, perhaps. So here's my theory. Somebody out there, and I wonder if it's the Vikings playing a role, is causing Levis to fall in like mock drafts and putting and, and and I mean this is we are right now going into the heart of one of my favorite times a year, silly season for the draft. <laughs> Levis's fall is precipitous, and I don't know it's necessarily fair, but something is going on there, and I wonder if it. I wonder if the Vikings are among the teams trying to put out the whoa 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 on on him because if he gets down to, like let's say falls to, seventeen. Now you got a fighting chance if you want to trade up from 23. Yeah. At 7, I think it's a real long shot. Um, but there's just a lot of in- interesting things. And the one thing I'm not going to discount the Vikings from is being, especially with this group potentially, pretty savvy about things. Well, but the other thing too is you're kind of because you're kind of going off of correctly, like the mock draft consensus that there's a huge gap between, even though he's the fourth quarterback, Will Levis and maybe Hendon Hooker. What we don't know. Maybe the Vikings view Hendon Hooker as a lot better than where the mocks have him. Just like the Vikings did with Anthony Barr. Ten, you know, Mike Zimmer said, all oh, the mocks had Anthony Barr as like a late first round pick or early second round pick. And Mike Zimmer thought, actually, we should use it. Was it the ninth overall pick or whatever it was? So that's the biggest wild card here is we don't know what the Vikings quarterback big board says internally. And nor will we unless we can sleuth our way into the to the war room at some point. Dude, that's your job, Doogie. Go get a picture of uh, of where the Vikings have Hendon Hooker sometime in the next three weeks. I will do my best. Now, <laughs> Judd Levis, as far as I know, will throw tomorrow at his pro day. Is that correct? That's what, yes, I think he will. All and right, I, I, so... And he threw at the combine, too, correct? Wait until you see some of the throws he makes tomorrow. Yeah. I get it. When, you know, you're throwing against air, right? I mean, nobody's actually defending you. Nobody's rushing right. you. But we've seen it often after these pro days that a bunch of personnel just fall in love after watching somebody throw. Yeah, I'm just saying, let's watch how Levis does tomorrow. If he throws like I think he'll throw, I think some of that chatter about him falling to the teens, maybe even to 17, I think that will come to a screeching halt. Yeah. Okay, uh, a huge move. We've kind of buried the lead here, but a huge move yesterday by the Vikings. <laughs> To retain C.J. Ham, and there's been some confusion because the initial report was that, or maybe I, I maybe I saw it characterized wrong by one of the the outlets that because uh, it was really it was Blake Barrett's agency broke the news on Twitter I think Barrett so C.J. Ham and Adam Thielen share the same agent Blake Barrett's but it was it was a, a re-signing as it was kind of aggregated but he's under contract for one more year it was characterized as a two year deal so. And he was—he only played like 150 snaps last year. So I guess why are they locking into more CJ Ham? And how long is the actual contract, Doogie? Well, I mean, I think it points to that he will play more snaps in 23 compared to 22. They want to run the ball more in 23. It is a two-year extension, the way it was explained to me. So he is now under contract. Doesn't mean he'll be here, but he's under contract through 25. So he was entering the final year of his deal. He gets two additional years, 24 and 25, the max he can make. Now, he's not making the max, right? But the max he can make over those two years is $6 million. What I am awaiting on is how his 23 cap number lowers because the cap number for 23 at what? Three point, is it five, six, seven, eight? It's over three is just too high for a fullback. So with this extension, how much did they lower his 23 cap number? That will come out later today. May I submit to you, much like an episode of Sesame Street, today's today's number from the count is 22. 22. In other words, 
Are the Vikings about to use 22 personnel next wow. season? Two tight ends. Wow. Two tight ends. Now, C.J. Ham would be some sort of more of an H-back probably in this, but essentially two guys in the backfield and one receiver. Dukes, is that what we're talking about here? Because I thought Ham might be gone, and not only is he not gone, he's being retained, and they wouldn't retain him unless they had a use for him. That's exactly it. Now, I don't know how much 22 personnel we'll see. I mean, they have some flexibility. I mean, Wang Wu is still here. Yeah. You add Brandon Powell on a one-year deal with his speed, right? So you've got some speed-type options with probably someone else to come. But I'm just saying, yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, you don't retain Ham without some sort of idea that you are going to use him more. Because I'm with you. I mean, two months ago, I would have told you, easy cut. Like, what would be the point in retaining C.J. Ham? So the fact that they're retaining him tells you plenty. So just for fun here, because, you know, we talk so much about Kevin O'Connell comes from the McVay tree, but he really comes from the Shanahan tree. It's all part of the same tree. So Kyle Shanahan last year with the 49ers in the regular season, you know, George Kittle was the, the bell cow, you know, pass catching. He can block to tight end. So he played almost all the snaps. You know, how much did they use a secondary tight end and a fullback? So Kyle Juszczyk, who's... Well, Juszczyk, right? I mean, he, he played 500, I don't know what count was. 500 snaps, okay. which is about half the snaps. Yeah. And then they had three backup tight ends. That, so Tyler Croft, Charlie Warner, and uh, Ross Dwelly, those guys all in a bin together played like 600 snaps or more, like 650 snaps. So they devoted, outside of Kittle, they devoted like 12, 11 or 1,200 snaps to secondary tight ends and a fullback in San Francisco. Interesting. Well, yeah, you may be on to something on that. The Troy Reader contract, one year. So I know Schefter had the report on Powell. Being a one-year deal, don't know if the reader terms were out there, but one year. And he's just kind of a guy, reader. right? He's, he's a guy. He, yeah. he started for them their Super Bowl year, but he was he, he was actually one did. of the one of the worst coverage linebackers in the NFL, according to PFF. He's just kind of a depth guy, right? Well, I mean, you have to wonder. Yes, he was pretty good, or at least serviceable in twenty-one with the Rams, but then in twenty-two he goes to the Chargers, can't beat out a day three draft pick. Forget the guy's name, but. And he may yeah. have been a fourth round pick, not a seventh round pick, but still a day three draft pick beat out reader for a starting job. So yeah, he's essentially a body, but you look at the linebacker position, right? Die, Asamoa, Hicks. There is an opportunity for somebody to pop. Special teams. Mm-hmm. Special teams competition. That's what we are taught. Well, it, and I mean, in all brutal, but yeah, they're teams. losing Chris Boyd, who was a special teams ace. Yeah. He's visiting the Giants right now. There just hasn't been any steam on the Vikings looking to retain Chris Boyd. So there will be an opportunity for somebody to pop on special teams. Chris Boyd played well on special teams, I thought, in 2022. Um, But I think he might have sealed his fate when he he was asked why he wasn't getting a chance to start at corner and basically said, I don't know. They haven't come to me yet. (laughs) I thought, yeah, Chris, you're a special teams guy. No, they definitely they came to you. Well, the old coaching staff came to you a couple of times and uh, no one was home. So it wasn't working out. Let's just put it that way. Wasn't he the leader of Kirko Chains? He was wasn't big... he the one? Wasn't it Darisaw's chain? But it was Boyd who grabbed Darisaw's chain, put it on Kirk. Boyd was right? a so big that time that locker out? room presence. Yeah, he so was does that even time. things out that he no. was the leader of Kirko chains? No, no, right. sorry. I mean, they're <laughs> gutting. They're, they're gutting the leadership, right? So Chris Boyd was the leader of Kirko chains. You have Eric Kendricks, Adam Thielen. Um, real quick on, on Brandon Powell, the sort of five eight gadget receiver punt returner guy. Deck, we were texting with the three of us yesterday uh, and Declan floated the notion. I mean, he's, he's a, he's a punt returner and uh, he does have a punt return touchdown in his career against the Vikings in 2021. Remember it. what does, what does his role look like? I could see him catching. He caught like 25 passes or something last year uh, because of just Rams injuries and depth issues. But does this say anything about Jalen Rager who basically wasn't used offensively outside of eight catches and is uh, shaky as a punt returner in terms of being able to hold on to the ball. What do we What do we think? Well, I mean, what I believe is Powell was signed to absolutely be the number one punt returner. Don't know if that's any sort of indictment on 
you know, Rager's future. Not sure there is much of a future for Jalen Rager here, but yeah. immediately, I mean, that tells me, okay, Powell is number one punt returner. Wang Wu is still number one kick returner. And there may be some snap opportunities and three receiver sets where he can line up some gadget type plays, maybe line up in the slot. I, I think there were, I think that O'Connell, one of his biggest issues for him personally, as far as the offensive play caller last year was I don't think he had the personnel to do some of the most important things gadget wise he wanted. I think they hoped in giving up what a fifth round pick to Philadelphia that Rager would sort of come in and be that guy. And he just most definitively was not like, I do think that we are in for a lot more interesting play calling at times in 2023 than what we saw in, in 22, based on the fact that Kevin's going to trust his personnel to do th- those things far more. So, yeah, I would say that they are making some moves around the edges that are going to give them an advantage of plays they couldn't run last season. Completely agree. Now, no sense that they were in on Elijah Moore, the receiver the Jets traded to the Browns. They did have a little bit of interest in Miko Hardman, but you look at the money the Jets gave him – I just don't think the Vikings were willing to touch that sort of money. Yeah, Interesting. So where I'm just looking at over the cap right now, Dukes, you know, they, they waited a few days on the Davenport contract. Okay, so that's that's in the system now on over the cap. It is. Okay. And he'll meet with us later today. OK, so he is uh, being so formally he is, introduced. So right now on over the cap, the Vikings have one point one million dollars in cap space, which isn't even enough to sign your first round pick. So they do have a lot of work to do, but they can pull the trigger on a Brian O'Neill restructure. We got to figure out, and maybe this is our next topic here. Zadarius Smith say, you know, he said goodbye on social media to Vikings fans a few weeks ago, but there's been no movement on that front. Uh, the five million dollar guaranteed salary did kick in. They could still, if they if that. So what that means is, if they cut him, they have to eat more uh, dead cap. But they could still trade him and save the twelve million dollars. So my guess is they've they've got a couple trade irons in the fire on Zadarius Smith. Otherwise, they would have just cut him before the five million dollar chunk kicked in. So what do you make of what's going on there? I agree. Yeah, I mean the way it was explained to me last week was stay tuned on Zadarius and on Dalvin Cook. Now Dalvin could not pass a physical right now. I mean, he's only, what, two months removed from very serious shoulder surgery. Yeah. So let's just let those two situations play out. But I'm not convinced as we sit here on March 23rd, Phil, that both Zadarius and Dalvin are here come September. I think the draft is going to be so interesting. Absolutely. Far more than, than player procurement, I think, from an aspect of roster moves. So, like, that was... Last week was wave one, right? But wave two is coming. And <laughs> and again, though, Dukes, th- this goes back to a very important thing. Quarterback. Are they going to solve it in the draft? Are they going to try to make a trade? Are they going to table it? Which they could. So, like, there's just – it feels like the Vikings are giving themselves some freedom that I almost appreciate. Oh, I definitely appreciate moves. it. I mean, they know what the heck they're doing over there. We may not have all the answers today, but trust me. You know, they meet on a daily basis about all this Mm -hmm. stuff. They have formulated a very calculated plan over there. So, yes, absolutely. Now, they may not know. I don't think they know the end result on the quarterback position. Could it be Cousins in 24? Could it be Lamar Jackson? Could it be Will Levis? Could it be somebody else? I don't know if they know the answer. That's why they're doing all this due diligence. Yeah. Uh, Okay, before we move on to non-Vikings things, any other quick Vikings things from you, Doogie? Well, they are hosting some local draft prospects on April 11th. What is that, a Tuesday? Tuesday, April 11th. I know Brent Lang from Lakeville North High School, UMD. Offensive lineman John Michael Schmitz from the Gophers. Terrell Smith from the Gophers. They're still trying to figure out some dates on bringing in some non-local draft prospects, an offensive lineman from LSU, a defensive lineman from Bowling Green, a running back from Alabama, Birmingham. So like all teams, they will be hosting some draft prospects eligible players in the month of April. Okay. Real quick, a shout out to our friends at MyDollKnives.com. I actually had a chance to stop into uh, the Vivrant Knife Sharpening Headquarters over in YZ the other day, and uh, I went through a little sort of, I didn't go through the whole knife sharpening class, but I went through like an abbreviated 
Dude, Joseph taught me, in addition to sending your knives on a little vacation to get uh, professionally sharpened, which is awesome, and it boosts your confidence in the kitchen, guys, mydollknives.com. Joseph taught me, like, three different grips on a knife to help you. I think you see on these, like, cooking shows, and they're slicing and dicing right through the onion or the cucumber or the the carrot. And I'm always just like, derp, 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 derp. He taught me some uh, high-level grip. So they have cla- they have knife knife classes. They've got uh, sharpening. And you can check them out again at MyDollKnives.com. MyDollKnives.com. They'll send you a safe professional mail kit. You send your doll knives on a little sharpening spring break, and they'll mail your knives back to you all within just a few days, freshly sharpened at MyDollKnives.com. Okay. Cats return last night. The Wolves come back in the fourth quarter. He hits the game-winning free throws. Uh, Clamps McD plays ridiculous defense on um, on Trey Young and then Rudy Gobert. So a great way to welcome Cat back in. I'm not sure if I uh, would go as far as saying it was like a movie, <laughs> which is how he characterized it. I don't know what movie that would be. But um, well, I guess what did you make of... Him coming out and saying, yeah, there actually was a huge setback. And, like, why all the secrecy for the last four months? It makes no sense. It didn't make any sense. I mean, you look at other organizations, they're pretty darn transparent. The Warriors, when Curry was out, updating us. The Lakers, when LeBron has been out, updating us. The Pelicans, when Zion has been out, updating us. Why not put it out there that he had a setback? And there's all sorts of cryptic... You know, messages being sent, right, like on his Instagram story, or maybe it was his girlfriend's, doesn't matter who, but, you know, in January, he's in that in that walking boot, right? So you start asking all these questions, and he's volunteering a little bit of information on his Twitch. Yeah, the whole thing, just not handled very well. I've been efforting Tim Connolly for a sit-down, an on-camera interview for three and a half months. Crickets. Crickets, crickets. Crickets. I will also tell you, so my phone rings last Thursday afternoon or Friday. It was after we did our segment. It was Glenn Taylor. Now, full disclosure, I'd reached out to Glenn on a New York Post story trying to get some clarity on the sales situation. He offered that clarity. Then at the end, I said, hey, Glenn, like, what's up with Carl Anthony Towns? He declined comment. Right, That's the owner who just didn't want to say anything Hmm. on Cat. So just the whole thing has been weird. But, hey, he's back now. He was really good last night, right? I mean, they were plus 13 in his 26 minutes. Yeah, not quite sure about the movie script. I mean, heck, he misses that shot. He settled for, what, an 18-foot jump shot at 18 seconds when he should have drove the ball to the hoop like he did to get to the free throw line on that final Wolves possession. So, yeah, it wasn't. Hater. It wasn't a movie script. The best player on the floor last night was Jaden McDaniels. I mean, you said he it. was. Yeah, He's I mean, he incredible. Tra- yeah, I mean, you know, you look at Mikael Bridges making 480. I mean, Jaden McDaniels is worth more than that. You start doing the math on some of these contracts. How good was Nas Reed? Yeah. Pending unrestricted free agent. How good was Nas? He's going to get a $40, $50 $50 million dollar four year contract, well, I mean, too. Minimum four years at the mid level, right? So that's four years, 40 to 43 million. I mean, minimum. Somebody yeah. will give him. The mid level, but somebody with cap space may, yeah, may offer more. Like he is that good. But Jada McDaniels, by far, to me at least, by far the best player on the floor last night. Back to the uh, cat thing, just quickly, and Phil, if you could fire the reckless speculation sounder. So, reckless. I was sniffing around last night about this cat thing because it's all very I bizarre. Saw. You were very all- caffeinated as well. Henry Lake, our mutual yeah. friend. Yeah. My God. Yeah, he tweeted it out was a photo. Four I mean, by how the many freaking night. Diet Cokes do you need? Four. They're free. That's, okay. <laughs> that's obnoxious. That's a lot. Wait, you, you, you had four, di- but you it's had a four Diet Cokes in what time period? Throughout the course of the game. I started like, like, oh, like no, I started an hour before the game because I stopped by to get my aunt bobblehead with his dog. And so I got there early <laughs> and got the little ant. And uh, then I had four. So over like a, I don't know, four hour period. You know, Royce, he, Royce, he was told at a recent uh, checkup, he tweeted this out that his doctor told him he needs to cut way back on Diet Coke consumption. And so he said, you know what that means? Got to find a new doctor. Yep. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, come on. I had a nice chat with Patrick about some stuff about his doctor, and that's exactly what he said. And then he said, you know what? I'd rather <laughs> die. Yeah. So do, I don't uh, need to live. If the doctor wants me to do this, I'd rather die. Yeah, he's not going to listen. Uh, so to yeah, by the way, I'm complaining about you having too much caffeine as I'm Never sipping mind. a frappe. All right. <laughs> can I finish now? Yeah, you can. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, so anyway, in circling back on this whole cat thing, the one thing that I did here, and it, it makes some sense, especially as a guy that covered uh, pretty closely the Parisi and Suter wild years, is that the team, and, and by the way, I'm not defending the team. This is their fault. So just to be very clear, I'm the messenger of what I heard. I'm not defending it. The team feels they don't have control of the player, so they didn't feel comfortable knowing what to say at, for fear of alienating the player. That and sounds that's about right. Hey, that just read between right. the lines of some Finch on the record comments Right. the last couple weeks. Finch was a bit baffled on what to offer up. So many different doctors involved. Now, in Cat's defense, right, like, there's some questions we can ask about the Wolves' medical staff, right, going back to the Jordan McLaughlin calf injury, the Torian Prince shoulder injury earlier sure. in the year, right? So, I'm just saying, if you're Cat, if you're Cat's team, it was okay to seek a lot of outside help. I mean, there were multiple doctors involved throughout this process. It just doesn't feel it doesn't feel like from either side it was handled very professionally. I agree. Yeah. And so that's that's the problem. I, I blame both sides. But your excuse as a team can't be, well, we don't have control of the player. What are we supposed to do? You I, you get control. It doesn't have to be of the player, but it has to be of the situation. Yeah. Well, and mm -hmm. I'll say this. If he plays, and I don't know what they're going to do on that back-to-back -back this weekend, but they do have three days off, so maybe they manage it and he plays in both games somehow. But if he keeps playing the way he did last night for the remainder of the regular season and they get some run in the playoffs, it's good for two reasons. Number one, it helps the Wolves, gives the Wolves a chance to do actual damage in the playoffs, which would be great, right? But it also shows to if they decide this summer, hey, this whole thing's just not. We just we we got to shake it up a little bit here, and for various reasons, Cat is going to be the one that gets traded. It, it at least reestablishes his value as one of the best big men in the NBA, even if you only see it for like ten games, right? So it it's a win that he's back and playing like he did last night. Absolutely. Now, your first point to me is, you know, more in the present, right? Like they're just they're a much better team. When he's on the floor, like early on, there were a lot of people out there, you know, more so fans, not, you know, super educated people, right? Some fans are, but a lot of uneducated or semi uneducated fans were saying, oh, the Wolves are better off without Cat. Baloney, BS. The Wolves are so much better off with Cat on the floor. I'll tell you this much, like on that steal, then he glides to the basket, the dunk, right? Like I couldn't help but think like, really, you couldn't play on Saturday in Toronto? You couldn't play Friday in Chicago, but 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 he's saying that the, the that's the team's fault, right? I mean, he's saying that, he is, yeah, that the team yeah, I mean, didn't want him saying, to play I mean, in those games. He put it on Twitter. Can't wait to get fully cleared, yeah. right? So he may have been itching. You know, that's something I want to dig into a little bit more. That he looked so good last night. I just wonder if he could have helped them in the last week or so. Dukes, to your point though, there's a very important distinction here that I think we saw l last night. And this is what I would like to continue to see, but I have no confidence. Carl Anthony Towns as a basketball player can be marvelous. There's no question about that. No one's going to debate that. He brings a skill set for his size that very few have. Um, and he, he might be the best at that size for what he does. But all of that being said, you know what we saw last night? I think I saw him bitch at officials once, maybe once. There wasn't the flailing, the flapping. And, you know, as weird as he can be and as un as uncomfortable as he, he can be, there was never a point last night where I felt like he was trying to take control of the team. He was, like, trying to fit in. And he did a good job. Post game, he talked about Nas has to play more if he's being sincere. Um, that's the cat I want. I don't want the cat that thinks I'm the captain here. I want the cat who says, what can I do to help this team with my skill set? Because while I agree with you, the skill set is huge and they are never a better team without that skill set. There are times I disagree with you from a personality standpoint, and I think he's a drain. And last night, he was never, in my opinion, a drain on that team. It's a very important distinction, but I think that's what people are talking about when they roll their eyes and get sick of cat. Well, and I mean, last night, I mean, there was every opportunity to bitch about the officiating. I mean, post game, the crew chief, Ben Taylor, how Ben Taylor is a crew chief 
at this point is beyond me, but admitted <laughs> on the final play, Torian Prince fouled Sadiq Bey. All right, so Sadiq Bey should have gone to the free throw line with .5 seconds left. If he makes one, we go to overtime. If he makes two, Atlanta in all likelihood wins the game. But you think about Jaden McDaniels being whistled for a foul on Trey Young. Trey Young is brilliant at baiting the officials. I don't blame Trey. I blame the officials for blowing the whistle. Wasn't a foul. Trey Young gets three free throws. There was another foul where Trey Young ended up at the free throw line. So the officiating was all over the place last night. Heck, across the league. Monty Williams, after the Suns lose to the Lakers, was bitching about the free throw disparity, right? You think about the Mavs-Warriors game last night. The Mavs are now said to be protesting after they lost (laughs) because in their minds, the officiating was that bad. So across the board, the officiating has been as bad as ever. So Cat had every opportunity if he wanted to in that game last night. He could have also post-game. He spoke glowingly about Ant. Now, I expect Ant to be back on Sunday. You think about how big Sunday is in San Francisco against the Warriors. You think about tiebreaker ramifications. If the Wolves have any prayer to avoid the play and to get up to six, to me at least, with eight games to go, you need to win on Sunday. That's how big I Sunday's agree. game is. I anticipate Ant, I was told on Saturday morning, it would be a few games. Okay, well, he misses Saturday. He misses Monday. He misses last night. That's three games. That's a few. I anticipate Ant being back on Sunday, right? So they should have their full complement of guys on Sunday. But Cat was speaking post game last night about the evolution of Ant. I think Cat deep down now realizes, okay, like Ant is the alpha. This is Ant's team for me to go where I want to go, which is beyond the first round of the playoffs. I need to defer to Ant as much as possible. Yeah, it'll be so interesting to see how that starts to work here if he comes back on Sunday. So, all right, anything left in your uh, your scoop bag there? Shake it out for us. Is there anything well, in case left people on the here on Tuesday, I'll clarify what Glenn Taylor laid out to me. So, Mark Laurie, Alex Rodriguez, A-Rod was at the game last night. Mark was at the game on Monday in New York. Glenn told me there's nothing to worry about with this next 20% payment coming next week. It's on March 28th, so that would be, what, next Monday, Tuesday, whatever it is, Wednesday, early next week. This next 20% is due. The final 20% to get to 60% is then due on December 31st of this year. But Glenn did tell me there is a way for Mark and Alex to bring that all the way to March of 24. That they can prolong it by three months. They've brought in a few investors. They're still looking to bring in another investor or two. It's it's been a very interesting process. But in terms Mm. of... The immediate 20% payment, this next 20% payment due early next week, Glenn told me he's been led to believe by Mark and Alex directly that there are no issues with this next 20% payment. Reckless speculation. I also have some schools in on former gopher Jamison Battle. So, yeah, there is interest in just going the pro route, but with NIL money, playing in college, as long as you have eligibility – It's not necessarily a bad thing. So he is exploring playing another year in college, but it would not be for the Gophers. Here are the schools in on battle. Arkansas, Cincinnati, Clemson, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa State, LSU, Nebraska, Ohio State, Oklahoma State, Santa Clara, Utah, Wake Forest, Xavier, and Villanova. Eli King from Caledonia just completed his freshman year. At Iowa State, he is now in the portal. I texted with his dad late last night. As of late last night, the Gophers had not made contact. But Ben Johnson was all over Eli King coming out of Caledonia. So I will follow up on that. But as of last night, he had been in the portal for a full day yesterday, all day Wednesday. The Gophers had not touched base. I know this Pepperdine kid, Mitchell, is very much a high priority for the Gophers. Mm, mm, mm. Go, go. All right, Dukes. Great stuff, man. Great stuff today. Then the St. Thomas kid, Andrew Rohde. There's some Creighton buzz. The Creighton Blue Jays. Creighton buzz. Among a few uh, others, but definitely some Creighton buzz. Amazing. Yeah. All right, Dukes. We'll talk to you next week. Enjoy your weekend. Sounds good. uh, We'll talk soon. Phil, grab your pizzas, please. All right. I I literally haven't been to the office in two weeks. I know. Well, hopefully tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Come find me. I'll get your pizza. Are they the only pizzas in there still? They are. Yeah. You're last. Yeah. Okay. Congratulations. My Give five cheese pizzas uh, for Droogie's, <laughs> Droogie's uh, sports teams. Don't All, right. All right. See you, See you boys. Bye-bye. There's some reckless speculation for you. We're going to we're gonna also uh, 
in a separate episode of Mackie and Judd here today talk I think Judd you brought up something interesting about the the cat distinction that we should that we should talk about also on Mackie and Judd and then on Purple Daily we'll go through our state of the Vikings off season have a random Viking of the week daily Minnesota sports entertainment here on Mackie and Judd